Okay, so this is a demo video for my new H8 Allegheny asset for transport fever, also known as the thing that was screwing up my video schedule. Uh, so let's get the boring part over with. There's two locomotives in the download. There's the CNO H8 Allegheny and the Virginian Railroad AG Blue Ridge class, both of which are, you know, identical other than the skin and the whistle as they basically were in real life. So this has 7,500 horses, it goes 60 miles an hour, there's about 110,000 pounds of tractive effort, there's way too many polygons, uh, the custom whistle for both locomotives is in there, uh, they're available for purchase from 1941 to 1960 for the HA, 1945 to 1960 for the AG. Okay. So if you're actually playing the game and you're using the default pricing formula, this locomotive is both slower and more expensive than the default big boy. Now, because the game's economy is extremely simplistic and bases cargo payment rates for every cargo entirely on the speed of the delivery, there's actually no reason to ever use this locomotive in an actual game. Uh, be better to buy the big boy and deliver coal at 81 miles an hour because, you know, we all know how time-sensitive and perishable that coal is. So, commissioned by TransportFever.net user Bad Karma, who is in fact not boring, he's very interesting and handsome, and who put up with this thing taking about ten times longer than the estimate I gave. Uh, thank you, Bad Karma. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, a bit about the history of this locomotive, a bit about articulated steam locomotives in general, and some of the material circumstances which resulted in railroads ordering and operating these things. Uh, if y'all don't understand some of the railroad jargon in here that I'm sure is going to pop up, I suggest going and watching episode 8 of my Franklin series. And... I'll throw some explainers in the video here somewhere if I have to. So I'm bringing on my friend who helped me a bunch with getting the running gear working on this locomotive, uh, known to frequenters of this channel as Alex Jones on the Workers and Resources video, uh, steam locomotive expert, Wings and Strings. How you doing? Hey, doing all right. Uh, my voice is still a bit shot, but it's doing better than it was the first time we tried to record this. So yes, uh, we'll give it all we got. All right, this is po positive thinking. <clears throat> the power of positive thinking will help us here. Yes, the placebo will fix my laryngitis. I'm sure of it. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Get those get those good sugar pills. All right, so uh, let's start. What is an articulated locomotive, and why did why do we have them? Okay, so I think the best uh, place to start talking about articulated locomotives is actually in explaining what a conventional locomotive is and how it differentiates from an artic articulated. <clears throat> so with a normal locomotive setup, you have your boiler, which is your power generation source, and that generates steam, which goes to the cylinders, which drives a piston. And with a normal conventional locomotive, you have one boiler and you have one what's called an engine unit, which is a set of cylinders which drive, drives the driving rods. And the conventional way of, of making a conventional locomotive more powerful was generally just to put more wheels under it. So like in the 19th century, you started with a 440 and that grew to a 460 and then a 480 and a 410. But because of the dimensions of the firebox, which had to be very narrow and very deep in order to fit between the big driving wheels, uh, you were limited essentially in how efficiently you could generate power as you added driving wheels to that. So around the turn of the century, you get the development of locomotives with different boiler setups where the boilers are a bit larger and they're higher, higher up so you could have a deeper firebox that sits on wheels behind the drivers called trailing wheels. And this is what really opened up the way for 
locomotives to become much bigger and more powerful. So then you had the 442, the 462, and the 482, and then the Southern Pacific's 4102, and the Union Pacific's 9000 class 4122. But this is where we start running into sort of design limitations again. With the Union Pacific's 9000 class, uh, you have a very large boiler, but a fairly small firebox for it. Um, and you're only able to power one set of pistons to drive one set of driving wheels. And the issue with that is because of the limits of how wide you can make an engine, you know, which this is called the loading gauge, uh, you run into limits of how big the cylinders can be. So if you look at the front of the 9000 class, you'll notice it has a third inner cylinder, which is usually a nightmare to maintain and adds a lot to maintenance costs for trying to get a decent amount of power out of, out of a conventional engine. Uh, you also have the issue that because all 12 driving wheels are being turned by one set of rods, that set of rods is going to be very massive and all of that rotating motion and energy creates something called hammer blow, which, which is a downward force from unbalanced weight. That's like taking a giant hammer to the track. And this causes a lot of wear and tear to your track. And in addition, the engines are so long and rigid that you can only go through extremely broad, broad curves. Uh, so the 4122 is really about as long as you can get an engine. The Russians tried a 4144 and it was a disaster and couldn't run on the track properly. So engineers thought that they had come to the limit of what a locomotive can be. But then enter the scene comes a man named Anatole Malay, who had the idea that instead of having one set of cylinders, one engine unit, to drive one really long set of driving wheels, he would have two cylinder sets driving two smaller sets of drivers, so the reciprocating weight, you know, the weight that's moving around uh, is much, much lighter and distributed across different sets of parts. And in addition to that, uh, the front engine set is able to uh, pivot and follow the curves of the track because it's set to articulate uh, compared to the position of the boiler. And that's where we get the term articulated. Uh, so this is sort of what helped locomotive design to expand beyond the limitations of a single rigid wheelbase. Um, and this is what allowed locomotives to become more powerful and to give more power um, out of one boiler and as such out of one engine crew. So, I mean, the thing is, right, you know, you're trying to get more power out of one boiler, but the real question is why not just use two smaller locomotives? You know, you can couple these things together, right? That's what a train is. Yeah, um, there's, and to be fair, there are a lot of benefits and sort of maintenance and, you know, logical justifications for operating a fleet of smaller locomotives and attaching them as necessary. That's sort of the way that modern diesels work. Instead of having, you know, like a giant diesel locomotive that hauls an entire train, you have a lash up of two, three, four, sometimes five or more of them. Uh, but the reason that railroads are okay with doing that today is because of a system called multiple unit, which is where one engineer can control four or five diesels at once because the controls are hooked up between the locomotives and they can operate uh, synchronously. With a steam locomotive, however, every steam engine you operate, so if you're double heading or triple heading or double heading with a mid-train helper and, and a pusher at the back, every single one of those locomotives requires another engine crew and railroads were looking to cut as, as much labor cost as they possibly could. Uh, really, a lot of their, you know, cost-saving enterprises were against sort of the pursuit of fuel efficiency and especially in this case against the uh, well-being of their labor force. 
you know, any chance that they had to get rid of or eliminate helper service and replace two smaller engines with one big one, that's an entire crew and, a, you know, an entire crew's wages that they no longer have to pay. And they really, uh, in some cases, even went out of their way just to build these, like, bigger and more ridiculously powerful engines almost past a point of practicality because... Uh, as we'll see further, the Lima Allegheny, the 2666. As a brief aside here for the uninitiated, the Lima Locomotive Works was a company that built locomotives in a factory in Lima, Ohio. And uh, yes, it's it's Lima, Ohio, and it's Lima, Peru. So hold your pronunciation criticisms at the door. Uh, the Lima Locomotive Works came up with the idea of superpower uh, steam locomotives and those are big steam locomotives with big fireboxes and those locomotives use steam more efficiently and powerfully uh, this use of the phrase superpower predates uh, action comics number one by about 10 years so uh, y'all should uh, thank uh, Lima for your superhero movies the Lima Allegheny the 2666 uh, even though it has uh, 7,500 horsepower on paper, uh, the actual way that that power and weight is distributed and how it gets to the rails and translates into tractive effort is surprisingly inefficient. Uh, if you compare the Allegheny to uh, the Chesapeake and Ohio H7s, which were a set of 2882 locomotives that they were intended to replace, they really only had... I think it's about 10 to 12,000 more pounds of tractive effort. And when you're talking about starting a train uh, and sort of getting all of that tonnage underway, you don't really want to look at horsepower. You want to look at tractive effort because that's how you take the power of the locomotive and actually convert it into the ability to grip the rails and pull the train along. You know, you could have the most powerful locomotive on paper, but if you don't have enough drivers and enough weight on those drivers uh, to actually get a train started, there's really no point because you're not going to get anywhere. And the main design flaw with the Lima Allegheny is that you have this uh, big, deep firebox which aids in combustion, but it's sitting on a six axle trailing truck. And so even though the Alleghenies are extremely heavy locomotives, um, only a portion, a smaller portion of that weight is actually going on the drivers because you have this big trailing truck taking the weight and uh, essentially not putting it to use because it's just supporting the weight uh, to reduce the axle loading. And even despite their efforts to reduce axle loading, the Lima Alleghenies had one of the highest axle loadings of any locomotive built in the United States. And this required extremely heavy rail for them to run on in order to avoid destroying the track. And it also created a controversy with the way that the crews were paid. Um, again, going into sort of the ways that railroads have screwed over their workers is that the Chesapeake and Ohio had a pay structure where a portion of the pay that they paid to engineers and firemen uh, was based on the weight on the locomotive's drivers. Now, with the H-8, as delivered from Lima, they had initially underreported the total weight of this engine. And as such, crews were paid less than they would normally get under this pay structure. Uh, and that caused the crews to, you know, very justifiably be angered that Lima and the CNO were withholding this information, were skewing it and resulting in less pay for them. So they demanded back pay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So they demanded back pay and Lima uh, was eventually sued by the Chesapeake in Ohio uh, and ended up winning over $3 million in settlements uh, in order to compensate for the back pay that they lost and uh, sort of the damage to their reputation and the flack that they were getting right. from their that's, workforces. And that's 1940s dollars, so the $3 million meant something. <laughs> yeah, it's a decent chunk of change. Uh, also, another fun 
a uh, little side effect of this payment by uh, percentage of weight on the locomotive drivers. A lot of bigger locomotives had something called an automatic stoker, which came as, came out about because these engines were so massive that even if the engineer and fireman were shoveling coal constantly together, you couldn't keep up steam in these massive boilers. So larger locomotives like the Allegheny had automatic stokers, but a lot of smaller locomotives and older locomotives, uh, which were lighter, were still hand-fired. So you would get this situation where if you were being assigned a run on an Allegheny, you, you were pretty lucky because, you know, you got paid more because it's a bigger engine, but you also didn't have to shovel it yourself. You just worked the automatic stoker, whereas someone stuck on like a switching engine or a local freight would have to be bailing in the coal for the entire journey, shoveling tons of coal and getting paid less because the engine's smaller, despite doing a shit ton more work. Yeah, these things took up a lot, right? Like the big boy took uh, like... I think 14 tons of coal an hour or something like that, you know, comparably sized locomotive. So I don't know what this one took. Uh, I haven't looked into it, but I would assume the Allegheny, uh, because it has, I I would say it's more or less, it, it would probably be the same because here's the other thing is that Lima wanted to have this big, long, wide, deep firebox on a six axle trailing truck as sort of the ultimate in their superpower concept. But the, the thing is, other locomotives like the Big Boy and like the H7 and pretty much every other articulated locomotive just got away with uh, having a slightly shallower firebox and then just making it longer and making the combustion chamber in front of the firebox longer. And you end up getting the same effect of heating while being able to put more weight of the firebox onto the drivers. Because uh, if, if you look at the insides of the big boy, the flues or the tubes in the boiler uh, from the firebox to the flue sheet are only about 22 feet long. And that's because of the very long firebox and the long combustion chamber ahead of it that you have in the big boy. Uh, so, like Lima, you get a longer flue sheet, so you have more boiler heating surface in the flues. But either way, it's, you still get the issue of all the way to the firebox is going onto trailing wheels and not the drivers. So a lot of that uh, horsepower was lost because you're not translating it to tractive effort. You're just, you're just sitting there spinning your wheels. Not that that's it's, uncommon with steam locomotives. Uh. <laughs> yeah, wheel, wheel wheel slip is a factor of life for pretty much every every steam locomotive. It, this is the H eight is what happens when Lima, a company that really didn't build any articulated locomotives, tried to build one but didn't understand the changes in design that are necessary for making an effective articulated. Because really. If you compare the Allegheny H8 to the Norfolk and Western Class A, which they were meant to sort of, that's the engine that they wanted to directly compare it to. The Class A makes like 90% of the power and 90% of the the tractive effort, but at like 70% of the weight. Because really the only reason the Allegheny was as powerful as it was is they just they brought the weight up to absurd levels and the axle loading up to really borderline unusable levels. You had to be using (laughs) ridiculously heavy rail just to keep it from flattening the track. Yeah. I'd I'd love to know how they, uh, how they moved it into the B and O railroad museum on the, uh, on the crap track. I'm sure they got leading into that place. Very, very slowly. Yeah. And very carefully. If you want to go see an Allegheny, uh, there are two preserved, one at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum in Baltimore and one at the Henry Ford Museum, which apparently they brought there under its own power. Uh, a couple <laughs> other things. Uh, the, the locomotive obviously named after the Allegheny Mountains or really, I believe, actually Allegheny, Virginia, which is a town between White Sulphur Springs and Clifton Forge, 
which is one of the major grades on the Chesapeake and Ohio, this locomotive was designed to uh, 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 climb over or was supposed to. And the, the idea being they'd, they'd stick one on as a helper in Clifton Forge and bring it over to White Sulphur Springs. Um, you know, they still needed two locomotives in the end because, again, no tractive effort. Um, why didn't they just use a booster? Another little aside here, a booster is a little engine unit that powers trailing wheels while a locomotive is running at low speed. Some booster engines were even applied to wheels underneath the tender. That's actually a very good question, and uh, I guess the main reason is boosters were normally seen more on, uh, you know, sort of fast express locomotives like the New York Central's J3 Hudson uh, because with the Hudson especially, we have very tall drivers and an even smaller portion of the weight on those drivers. So if you even want to try to get a long stream of heavyweight passenger cars going, you need that booster. But I would assume Lima's decision against that would be, A, it's an admittance of defeat, and B, <laughs> it's because uh, boosters are usually very tedious to maintain. And as touched on earlier, locomotive uh, loco locomotive designers and the companies that order them will go out of their way to avoid efficiency and avoid even like good designs that are powerful if it means saving a bit of money. Uh, like if you notice, you might you might be wondering why a lot of railroads didn't use Alesco or Worthington feed water heaters, and that's because the extra cost that they had to pay out for maintenance and the paying of the mechanics to keep those operating actually cost more than the water that they were wasting by not using them. So the railroads just decided, screw it, we're going to waste water because it's cheaper. It's cheaper than maintaining a feed water heater. Kind of messed up if you think about it. That's the, that's the little tank on the front of the locomotive, right? Yeah, it's... Um, okay. In a Lesco feed water heater, you can normally notice uh, you spot it as sort of a long horizontal cylinder in front of the locomotive. Like you could use um, a Texas and Pacific 2104 as an example here. Um, a Worthington feed water heater is usually like a square box that fits into the smoke box. Uh, you could pull up like a Cotton Belt 484 for that, you know, or a Southern Pacific GS8. Uh, there's also the unusual coffin feed water heater which was used on those really ugly 284s i'm sure you know the one uh which is like the big arch in front of the smoke box oh it's really ugly oh i think i have seen that but yeah i have to pull that one up somehow <laughs> yeah so long story short railroads are very weird they're incredibly driven by cost incentives before anything else um they don't like labor they, they <laughs> definitely do not like labor they go out of their way to reduce as many crews that they have to pay and really like that's why dieselization happened as quickly as it did in the united states compared to other countries they had the money to buy new diesels and they wanted to save on labor costs so they fired as many engineers as they could got a bunch of diesels that they could run as a multiple unit and they were on their way and now they've invented pre precision scheduled railroading and have fired even more engineers and gotten rid of more locomotives but that's a different story uh so i guess the reason i brought you on while you're struggling to speak is to plug your patreon so let's go oh yeah i have one of those <laughs> <laughs> so uh the main thing i do besides uh rambling through this uh hoarse voice about locomotive design and history is i am a freelance artist and i like to not just talk about big dumb steam locomotives but paint them as well and so i have a patreon where uh I paint big dumb steam locomotives and in fact uh, you can throw it up now the painting I did this month is a quaint little scene of a crew taking a breather between runs in front of one of the locomotives we've been talking about this Allegheny and so I do two paintings like this a month 
and I'm doing a special promotion just for you guys uh, where all of my $2 a month uh, perks I will be making available at the $1 a month level uh, and you'll be grandfathered in. Uh, so $1 a month uh, with my Patreon, that's the same amount as buying one crappy meal a year at Popeye's. Uh, and for that same value, you get a minimum of 24 paintings a year. You get the ability to see them in early access. You can see works in progress. You can see my painting methodology. You could go to live streams where I paint, live streams where I critique other people's work and help them with their art. And also live streams where I make Valve Gear tutorials uh, in the works, um, sort of like the Baker Valve Gear, which I helped Do Not Eat rig up for his transport fever model. Yes, it was and very also, helpful. I am forever in your debt, by the way. Uh. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. I'm just glad I was able to help with that because it's like the one thing I know semi decently. <laughs> Something I always struggle with. <laughs> Yeah, ba Baker Valve Gear, this is a little tangent, is especially tricky because uh, unlike Walsh Hart's Valve Gear, there's a lot of indirect motion and a lot of overlapping yokes and levers and transmission bars. Uh, so unless you color code it and specify which joints are fixed and which, which are moving, it can be a nightmare to figure out. Uh, but all of that and more, I hope to one day be able to explain in videos and with animated interactive sort of simulation things that I'm making in a 2D animation program. And in addition to all of those perks, uh, I have a monthly patron's choice painting where we come up with a topic and you get to actually vote on the paintings that I make. Because I feel like if you're being generous enough to support my artwork and help me buy food and shit, uh, you should get a say in the stuff that I paint for you. So it's fun. I'm hoping it's a great way for people to not only uh, get fun, uh, informative knowledge about the politics and socio-political history of railroads through Do Not Eat, but to also appreciate the technology and the aesthetics of them uh, through my stuff. So if Do Not Eat is the new up and coming dude in bread tube, then I am hopefully uh, the start of Rose's tube, which is where we just have a bunch of cool, pretty stuff that we make. Yes. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Uh, so go, go, go buy the art, buy the art. It's good art. Buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh God. Should I say that joke that we did between takes? Uh, what, what I say it's like if you were a loved one like my art I may be entitled to financial compensation yes yes I like that <laughs> <laughs> thanks Wings for coming on this video uh, yeah thank you for having me uh, no problem it was, it was fun it's a good time we all had we all have fun here <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I think that's the end of the video I don't know how to do a proper outro because, again, I, I, I do scripted stuff. I don't do podcasts. This is too similar to a podcast for me to be comfortable. So um, I'm just going to say uh, bye, everyone. And I don't know if you want to. Eat your vegetables. Uh, take care of your throat. Abolish ice. Trans rights are human rights. Uh, Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter. matter. Be sure to drink your oval team. <laughs> Especially that one. <laughs> and uh without yeah. further ado, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been whatever. Uh thanks for having us on. Uh mm -hmm. we'll see you next time. Thank you and good night. Good night, everybody. Roll credits. All right, so yeah, that they got a they got an H eight in uh, Thomas and Friends now. His name is Sam, right? Oh God, that's yeah, right. And, yeah, and he's like he's like got like a, a Texan <laughs> accent, and they like show him going through the American Southwest, you know, which is uh, he's got Virginian writing on the side, so I guess he's an AG and not an H eight. Well, whatever he is, 
as soon as he touches, you know, any section of the British rail system, their loading gauge is fucked. Oh yeah, they just uh, they just collapse out underneath. Them. I I took the most issue, honestly, with um with the accent. I I thought I if if if, if you the producers are listening, uh, the producers of Thomas the Tank Engine, you, what you should do is you should look up a podcast called Trillbilly Workers Party, right? And there's a guy on there named Tom Sexton, and that's who Sam, the Virginian Railway AG Blue Ridge class, should sound like. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, ideally, Sam, the Blue Ridge engine, should sound like pure silence, because what the fuck is that engine doing on Sodor? They, they, they have... What the fuck is anything doing on Sodor? If you go and try to find Sodor on the map, you're going to get very wet because it's just a chunk of ocean. I, I, There's I, nothing out there. It's not real. No, S- Sodor is real. Sir Topham Hat is real. He is strong, and he is my friend. He's not your friend. He's not your friend. He's a capitalist who threatens his workforce with death if they aren't oh, useful. That, yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. All, right, all right. All right. So no... no, no. Sir Topham is a bastard, and I wish nothing but ill will upon him. I hope he gets what I got right now. <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna cause him some confusion and delay. <laughs> this, is a, this is a dumb segment. Hold on, sorry. Can I redo this take? <laughs> yeah, sure. I, 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 I can... <laughs> that, yeah. that works for me. Uh, we, we can fix everything in post. <laughs> yeah, sorry. My, it was cutting out a lot more than it was. You know, you know who you all, yeah. you know who else uh, fixed something uh, horse in post? This, this, the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> <laughs> 